This feature is brought to you by JPHMP Direct, an online community for advances in public health. In this video, I will be discussing some tips for writing an abstract for publication, which is a part of the Scholarship of Public Health series written by Dr. Justin Moore on JPHMP Direct, which you can find the full post at jphmpdirect.com. There will be four areas of consideration that we will discuss, with the first one being abstract formats of journals and conferences vary immensely both between and within the genre. For example, let's consider two conferences. The Southeast chapter of the American College of Sports Medicine Regional Conference and Active Living Research Annual Conference. The first one requires the abstract to have headings, the dimensions of the box to be 5.75 inches wide by 5 inches high with less than 25 lines of text. You can click here to see a recent call for abstracts. An example of a submission may have 231 words exclusive of names, affiliations, headings, and funding disclosures. Compare this to the second conference, which requires abstracts to have 450 words, including headings. Keep in mind that journals also differ. They may allow as few as 150 words or as many as 300 words. So the first takeaway point is to identify the conference or journal prior to writing the abstract and to study instructions for authors before submitting. The second area of consideration is the desire or requirement of a journal for the authors to include specific information or detail in the abstract. For example, the American Journal of Preventive Medicine requires that in the abstract, there is the date of data collection and analysis. The type of information required will vary by journal or conference, and much of the variability pertains to the presentation of data. For example, the American Psychological Association and the American Medical Association are the two most commonly used formats by public health journals and are specific about presentation of p-values. AMA requires that p-values are expressed to two digits to the right of the decimal point unless the p-value is less than 0 0.01, in which case it's expressed to three digits. To further complicate things, some journals discourage point estimates, such as means, and p-values in the abstract, while others, like JPHMP, prefer their inclusion. So takeaway point number two is to review the most recent issues of a journal or listing of conference abstracts before writing the abstract for a manuscript presentation to ensure consistency with recently published and accepted abstracts. The third area of consideration is that when presenting results or data, explicitly describe the findings of your study. You want to make sure to stay within the confines of your evaluation or research design. So, for example, with cross-sectional studies, which are those that compare more than one group at the same time, make sure not to use any causal language. More importantly, don't bury the lead of your study and don't rely on an individual reader's statistical acumen or content knowledge in interpreting your results. The best abstracts give a measure of effect and the practical significance of that effect in plain language. Let's take a look at this example of a hypothetical result. The logistic regression model indicated that the television viewing was significantly associated with sedentary time after controlling for physical activity, age, and gender. It tells us that television viewing is associated with sedentary time, but it'd be nice to know how much television time is associated with how much sedentary time, and to what population this is referring to. This is a better example. The logistic regression model indicated that television viewing was significantly associated with sedentary time in that children who watched more than three hours of TV per day were 73% more likely to spend over five hours per day sedentary after controlling for physical activity, age, and gender. So we can see that including the odds ratio with confidence interval gives support for the statement here, 
which provides some interpretation. The important suggestion here is to not hide interesting or important findings by not giving context for the findings or reporting only a p-value, as is the case with the first example. Takeaway point number three is that to get the attention of editors and reviewers, make obvious the public health importance of your findings. And some final piece of advice is to write your abstract last. It might be tempting to write first, but often you'll redo analyses, reframe the results, and shift emphasis in the discussion as the writing process evolves. You certainly want your analyses to be final before writing the abstract results and conclusions, because writing these sections while analyses are being conducted can be vague and hurt you in the review process. So in summary, identify the outlet for submission prior to beginning the writing process, review recently published abstracts to learn the style of the journal or conference, highlight the practical importance of your findings, and write the abstract last. And that concludes this tutorial for how to write an abstract. For additional resources and more from this column series by Dr. Justin Moore, please visit the following link.